Okay. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce today uh, Manu Prakas. Um, he obtained a, a Bachelor in Technology, um, in, sorry, in computer, com in computer Science and Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology. And then he moved to, to the United States, where uh, to the MIT, where he obtained his Master and, and PhD uh, in Applied uh, Physics in 2008. Since uh, 2011, he's professor at the Stanford University, and, and his research can be described in a nutshell, or he describes also in a nutshell, uh, as, as driven by curiosity. And I think we, we are all going to enjoy that curiosity uh, today. He uses a broad range of interdisciplinary approaches, including theory and different experiments to understand how computation is embodied in, in biological systems. And he's also well known for his inventions uh, and tools aimed to democratize the access of science, and that will include uh, origami microscopes and, and tools for diagnostics, diagnostics of, of diseases such as malaria. Um, for those of you that have been here for a few years, you may remember that at the European Night of Science, we had uh, origami uh, microscopes, uh, and, and we could uh, enjoy the pleasure of, of using them to, to see uh, pond water and, 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 and to, to rediscover si uh, uh, um, uh, microorganisms with, with many people from the public. And, and, and I think this is a critical uh, um, thing that uh, Manu is, is bringing, this idea that uh, the barrier between scientists and the public can be broken by, by providing tools that we all can use to, to understand our work. Uh, he has been awarded with numerous prizes and recognitions for his work and also for his inventions. And that also includes uh, many recognitions from, from popular media, uh, such for example, being selected as the 25 people shaping the future by, by the Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, it is my pleasure, Manu, to, to have you here, and we are all looking forward to, to your uh, talk. So please. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, I changed the title because I never gave the title, and I was worried about the title outside. Uh, but this is going to be a little bit about entertainment and connecting to curiosity. Uh, I'll try to cover far more than I have time for. Uh, which is always a puzzle. So I think I want to give you a much more of a broader view of the types of questions and why we ask those questions. So there will be a little bit of a philosophical framework to what I want to talk about. And then, of course, I am here both today and tomorrow. Uh, if any of these things uh, get you excited, uh, then we can have uh, many more conversations to begin with. Um, I titled this Recreational Biology uh, primarily because I've been exploring this connection between a very old field in mathematics called recreational mathematics. So quick raise of hands. How many of you know of this name, Martin Gardner? OK, this actually, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy, at least you know, 10, 15 people. He's probably one of the most famous uh, author in mathematics. Uh, he didn't have a mathematical degree, but popularized mathematics. So for the folks who uh, get excited about this. It's just in a remarkable amount of, I mean, many of you know Conway's Game of Life. Uh, you know uh, many of the tiling patterns. But what's powerful in what he described as a field of mathematics was this idea that you should be able to simplify your questions uh, that anybody walking on the street should be able to understand. And that led to, and this framing of questions has led to a remarkable group of people who didn't even realize that they are mathematicians or they love mathematics or they would want to explore to engage actually in the field of mathematics. And uh, the thread that I often think about is that there is an analogy to it in biology. We'll talk about that, explore it, that sometimes you can frame a question that is so simple to ask but actually requires all of our energies uh, to be able to address. Uh, of course, uh, because I said I never finish my talks in time, uh, <laughs> but this is evening talk, so it's actually good that anybody who wants to stay can stay. I want to acknowledge just a remarkable group of people that I get a chance to work with. We do a lot of field work. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I'll mention the students that are engaged and postdocs that are engaged. But uh, you know, it's the playfulness of uh, everyone ar around us that actually makes uh, something like this possible. And since this is a recreational biology talk, for folks that get completely bored of what I'm saying, I want to leave you start with a puzzle. 
uh, and you know, this is a very famous uh, uh, puzzle from Martin Gardner, uh, is how many pieces can you cut a donut with three straight planes? So if I have a tendency to doodle, if you get excited, shout out the answer uh, from the back once you've figured it out. What is the maximum number of pieces you can cut a donut? There will be a lot of topology in this talk, so I want your brain to be thinking about topology in three straight planes, with three straight planes. Okay, so let's start with a depressing letter that Max Delbruck wrote to Niels Bohr in 1954. This was the moment when the DNA structure had just been discovered. Uh, you know, Max Delbruck has played a very important role in biology, but he was a little bit depressed at that time uh, because he was starting to think about some of the ideas that he had been thinking about didn't pan out the same way. And then he refers back in that letter in the very end, this sentence that I absolutely enjoy. He said, I'll run into a paradoxical situation analogous to that in which classical physics ran in in its attempt to analyze atomic phenomena. This, of course, has been my ulterior motive in biology from the beginning. And what he's describing is his methodology of asking questions that are driven by paradoxes. I think many a times when you look at the edge of biology, you can explore uh, you know, a classic way of saying is, what's up with that? And the moment you ask uh, and frame this as a paradox, uh, you can anchor those sets of uh, questions uh, quite quickly. And for us, biodiversity is really that paradox. Just, I mean, shape and form, the amount of intensity that's associated with millions of species that are around us really make us, I mean, this is really the playground. Uh, I love this graphical description. This is from Charlie Harper, who's a very famous American graphic artist. Uh, and what he draws here is the tree of life in the sense where every species is drawn equal in size. So the lion and the amoeba are actually same size. And of course, as a biologist, we all know and understand the beauty and the puzzles that are hidden in these are equally important, you might discover. But from a general public context, sometimes this comes as a surprise because we think about the microscopic things that we can interact and engage and much of the microscopic, you know, at what rate is the microscopic biodiversity actually disappearing? We have absolutely no idea. Uh, and then, you know, just to put a little bit of an apocalyptic framework to this, this is a paper from Germany uh, a couple years ago, which is actually quite scary because uh, just like we are possibly losing species faster than we might be able to even discover them. I mean, this is three-fourths of all flying insects across Germany have vanished in the last 25 years. Uh, and sometimes when I think about this in the framing of teaching itself, not only is the biodiversity being lost, the idea of teaching natural history and the idea of field stations that are engaged and the fact that we actually train younger generations to go spend time in the field is also losing very quickly. You can map marine stations that existed 100 years ago and you would be surprised that we support less number of those stations as we do currently. Uh, and so again, you know, I think one of the things that I'll try to highlight with some of these puzzles is how important it is to spend time in the field uh, and then I don't want to give you a false impression for at least some of the younger audiences. If you don't go spend time in the field, it is not all rosy pictures. Uh, you know, you end up finding things that grow in your, uh, in your own body. Uh, that's actually a video from uh, Ellie in the lab. She just got back from Antarctica, and she sent me that footage. Uh, this is the Drake's Passage. Uh, with uh, gigantic waves, and of course, I'll show you some of the instruments we take out on these boats. Uh, so anyway, you know, don't blame me if you get stuck in those situations because I was talking and excited about field science. Uh, so here is the menu for today. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, this idea of topology in a cell and with a very simple question, whether do toroidal cells exist? You know, it's a, it's a simple thing, you know, I know spherical cells exist, so should toroidal cells exist or not? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about where is behavior encoded uh, in single cells, uh, and where is behavior encoded in cells or organisms that don't have neurons, and kind of this uh, broader picture of what we are thinking about, uh, can there be a mechanical brain, for example? And then uh, in the very end, if we get some time, uh, a little bit about how cells dissipate heat. And again, all of them have geometry, topology, and architecture as a key binding theme. And then uh, I think for folks that are interested, we'll end up talking a little bit about the experience of science. Okay, so let's begin with a cup of coffee. Uh, this is, a, 
I think it was a macchiato that we ordered today. And I just want you to appreciate this. I'm sure all of you have had this before, but notice the kind of layering that's present in this uh, cup. Uh, you know, there is very recently a mathematical paper written on what generates these layers. Uh, there are convection currents, of course, it's heat, the way you pour it. But the ocean uh, has an analogy to what's happening in this cup itself. You know, just like this is, even in this scale, is not a well-mixed bath uh, of a fluid, both life and every one of the environmental parameters in the ocean is actually stratified. Uh, and uh, there's a beautiful clip that I just want to show you guys. This is from World War I, uh, World War II, uh, and we'll see if some of you can hear it at the back. During World War II, American sonar researchers encountered a mystery. I love the music that makes it sound even more mysterious. Steps where no bottom should be. Even stranger, the false bottom moved. Deep in daytime, it crept closer to the surface as the sun went down. So many of you might know about this mystery that they're talking about. This is the largest biomigration on our planet uh, by mass which is what they said is that the bottom floor is rising. They were doing sonar measurements, and uh, at night they would see that what was a floor would rise up, and then at day it would go down. I mean, that's not possible. And eventually we learned that this is all actually driven by uh, life. Uh, what's fascinating is the fact that if you do a back of the envelope calculation for the amount of energy these organisms, you know, quadrillions of organisms rising up and down might be using, that's actually larger from one day than the energy budget of United States for an entire year. So as a biological phenomenon, it's a remarkable phenomenon of this up and down migration. And as I said, just like this cup of coffee, uh, you end up in this situation that this environment by itself is stratified. So these organisms are actually traversing ecosystems every single day. Uh, and the simplest way of thinking about this is, for example, if you could cut a chasm into the ocean uh, and you could literally walk through, you know, light, pressure, temperature, salinity, nutrients, everything that you think about between hundreds of meters is completely stratified. Uh, and much of the ocean is actually not in homogeneous bath. And effectively, organisms, including single cells, which we will talk about in a second, uh, traverse hundreds of meters, and we will talk about a cell that we had believed was actually non-motile, traversing 200, 250 meters across this. Uh, and of course, you know, why do we care? Uh, we care, uh, just like uh, the first talk in which you heard about what's happening uh, up here, I care about what's happening up here. There's a massive dynamics of what's happening in life in the ocean. Uh, but much of this is actually also fixing carbon. And so many of you know, when CO2 in the atmosphere get absorbed in the ocean, that transitions into generating living forms. When they die, they end up sinking to the bottom, and that actually drives uh, uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, to an extent that literally, if I was to turn this biological pump off, uh, the carbon in our atmosphere will transition from 400 parts per million to 600 parts per million instantaneously. So much of life in the ocean is absorbing between 40 to 50% of all anthropogenic carbon we are emitting. Uh, but you know, you might ask, okay, so uh, what is the, can we understand the biology? And you know, this is where the challenge comes about. This is what it sometimes looks like. I mean, these are natural blooms. There is a gazillion amount of interactions. Uh, it's actually quite a difficult problem to be even thinking about. How do we understand shape and form and function of many of these organisms that are traversing massive ecosystems across a short period of time? And then just from a very doom and gloom perspective of the IPCC reports, uh, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read some of these reports, and what you end up finding is there is very little biology. You know, although we know on this planet that biology has shaped our atmospheres and uh, the biospheres in so many ways, and I love the title. This is a very serious paper. It's a very well-cited paper. When you get to write the title of what the dash is wrong with the present calculations of carbon budget. And what they're talking about is what we measure in the atmosphere and what we measure in the ocean and what we emit is not matching up. That's because we don't have a biological context to this. So in the light of this, we're going to first talk about a non-motile cell uh, that traverses hundreds of meters across the ocean. 
Um, and I want to do this in context of uh, shape and form, uh, but the best way to kind of describe this analogy is this very famous painting uh, by Durer. Uh, this was uh, the very first painting of a rhinoceros that was ever made by a Portuguese artist. And the irony is that this artist never met a rhinoceros. And I feel sometimes we do that uh, in, when we're thinking about a cellular context, because you might meet a rhino and say, oh, what a docile animal, and of course, uh, this is not what you want to see. So we want, and again, to just make this very clear, uh, I'll leave you with a puzzle that I will not answer, although I do know the answer to this. Everybody knows Heckel here. So most of you have seen these beautiful organisms, they're plankton. I mean, look at the shape and form. We have absolutely no idea what this shape and form is actually doing. And even more simply, if I was to ask, did Heckel get it right? You know, gravity has been on on this planet the entire time. Uh, and of course, these are polarized cells. So if you were to meet this cell in the ocean, did he draw it upside down? It's a very simple thing, but actually, essentially, unless you meet them in their ecosystems and in their environments, we can really not begin to answer many of these sets of questions. OK, so with that as a prelude, let's take a boat trip. Uh, we have been very lucky for the last couple of years to take some of our science out at sea and really do cell biology in the ocean. And I'll talk about this boat, uh, Kilo Moana, uh, that goes off the coast of Hawaii. And the simplest question that we really want to ask is how, first of all, uh, do non-motile cells navigate the ocean? And then how would they do something like that? Uh, and you know, just to make it very clear, just for a very simple case of diatoms, you know, diatoms have glass shells. And on average, if you look at the cell density of a cell, it's roughly 5 to 10% greater than seawater. You know, diatoms have no known flagella. They have no known cilia, no known motile organelle. So how the hell do we not essentially over time have these cells? They also depend on light. And by the way, beyond 250 meters, there is no light. So how could a cell like this actually really survive from a sedimentation dynamics at the rate at which, depending on the density, this would essentially keep sinking? And then again, of course, we talked about uh, many of the sets of parameters are changing as a function of time of depth. So we started thinking about this, and uh, this is a project that we think about ecophysiology of what dinoflagellates are doing along this vertical axis. This is with two fantastic postdocs, Adam Larson, who did much of the cell biology and the biochemistry, and Rahul Chajwa, who's a, a physics PhD uh, uh, in my lab. And then, of course, a very large team, what we call gravity machine, which will become clear in a second. So let me take you on that journey. And the question or the paradox we asked is, can we find photosynthetic cells that do not do mixotrophy, so they don't eat other organisms, below this belt of 200 meters? So we put these sets of uh, capturing devices. We lower them down to 200, 250 meters, see whatever comes back, sort out to find only photosynthetic organisms. Uh, these tubes go down, and we can trigger them, so we are only collecting at that known depth. We know that these cells that we are collecting were at that depth. And uh, we got a hit uh, by this uh, pyrocystis noctiluca, which happens to be a dinoflagellate. Many of you have probably experienced it this way, if some of you have seen uh, bioluminescent. Uh, and then we looked in the record in old papers. It's actually from 1970. It has been described uh, that they do go all the way down to 200 meters. Uh, and the puzzle is that the cell has no motile organelle. And we're going to think a little bit about uh, how do I study a migration of a single cell, uh, you know, 200 meters, but I want to be able to do cell biology with it. Uh, I don't know the tallest building in Heidelberg, so I just chose something from a competitive school at Berkeley. That's around 100 meters, so I would like to make a microscope that's around 200 meters or so uh, to be able to observe this. And I'm not joking, we actually built a microscope that was five meters tall. Uh, this is in Madagascar. Uh, we study uh, several of these parasites and in doing these and packing these microscopes, a uh, uh, thought occurred to us is, what if the two ends of these tubes were actually connected? And that led to uh, essentially a hamster wheel for single cells. So the idea here is, could we essentially create a type of an environment that from a cell frame of reference, it's traveling infinite distances, but in the lab frame of reference, it's actually not going anywhere. And so there are two points on a wheel for example, uh, at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock, 
And we actually literally built first out of a hula loop, something like this. And if the cell is trying to swim down, you spin the wheel up. If the cell is trying to swim up, you spin the wheel down. And you know, this is not just a theoretical idea. We built this microscope. This is what we call a gravity machine. Uh, that wheel, glass wheel is roughly that big. You put the organisms, the microscope is along this axis. Uh, this microscope knows Navier-Stokes equations we can write down, and it's a little bit puzzling to think about because if you have any fluid and you have any experience when you move things around, you can induce inertia in the system, and that inertia can perturb the behavior. So there's a very strict mathematical criteria that we apply to be able to bound such that we can observe something without perturbing it. And you know, nature was kind to us when we draw the phase space of the behavior of organisms as a function of the inertia induction that would happen in these uh, uh, Stokes regimes, there is this red line. So as long as we don't crest this red line in parameter space, we can observe unperturbed behavior of organisms. And I'm just going to now show you a couple of movies to have, uh, you know, give a framework for uh, what does these data sets actually look like. Uh, so first of all, this is a, a gravity machine. It sits inside a temperature. And what's exciting is we can control pressure. We can control temperature. We can actually control gradients of salinity in a system like this. We can, of course, control light. Uh, but because it's a virtual reality environment for cells, we can give it cues that do not exist on this planet. For example, I could make the pressure increase while the cell is going up and confuse it because, of course, it's getting multiple sets of cues. So it's about cross-wiring environment itself and see what it would do. And one of the other things we do, we call this framework ocean on a tabletop. We can also create future oceans. We can create the kinds of acidity and salinity that would occur uh, in time and then essentially explore what do cells do. So you know, I just as a highlight, especially for some of the young folks here, you know, there is no idea that's new. And one day I was taking a flight, uh, and I love reading old books uh, from uh, uh, you know, bookstores. And uh, Alistair Hardy has been one of my heroes. And I open up this book, and the first page I open in this book is this cartoon of a person sitting with a giant wheel. He's actually, this is a jellyfish. And you see, he's sitting there for eight to nine hours watching and perturbing this thing up and down. And I mean, of course, you can see this is connected to a belt with a scratcher. And you know, so Alistair started thinking about this. And I got very excited about the history of this object itself. And I went in and recruited some people to find some letters that Alistair had written. And uh, in 1964, he was predicting the future. He said, the advances of electronics and the possibility of getting the equipment into a very small space offers all sorts of possibilities, which I think were not available when I designed my first machine. So anyway, he predicted us, and I'm very happy we fulfilled his possibilities. Uh, uh, but this is what the data sets look like. So this is Pteria miniata, an organism that we study quite a lot. And maybe I'll have a chance to tell you a little bit about how shape and form of this organism is so important. Uh, but what you're watching is essentially a visualization and a microscopy video. We can do subcellular structures. We can do calcium imaging in these systems. With Chris Lowe's lab, we have been building molecular tools to be able to tag different neurons. But what you saw as a video was essentially a larva climbing. You know, This is around half a meter. And right there, there is a little behavioral cue that I'll talk about in a second. But anyway, this just gives you a general idea of the types of data sets. For the last five years, we've been collecting and building what uh, we are calling a global motility atlas. And the purpose of this atlas is to really create the first open source database for all aquatic species that we can find. We are roughly around 200 or so species. And immediately, you can do all kinds of comparative analyses. You know, of course, when you start looking at this and you realize, ah, oh, sea cucumbers, they do some strange things there. Uh, while there are many stereotypical behaviors, uh, one of the phenomenal things, and again, some of this data is accessible on the Gravity Machine site, but a much larger database we will be releasing for people to you know, not only acquire the kinds of genomic data sets that are out there, to also be able to map behavioral data sets. Uh, and you know, this is one example of that data set. So this is, again, Pteria miniata. You get to do visualization at a single cell, but you also have the entire 3D trajectory of this organism, and it's climbing. And you see, this is what I was talking about. Right there is a reversal of cilia. It does turn around. And I'll actually show you that this is essentially a, a feeding blink. Uh, and the organism does that again in a very periodic manner. 
And this is a zero information environment. So we're imaging in IR. There are no cues other than just gravity. Gravity is the one thing in our lab that we cannot turn off. Uh, and I'll tell you about some perturbations that we accidentally discovered. But again, you know, this is what the data sets look like. And then when we do the type of analysis, something really strange pops out. Out of the 200 species we've looked at, I can only find one species so far that does not care about the gravity axis. And it turns out that gravitaxis is actually absolutely ubiquitous in the ocean in all of these aquatic species. And what's happening is all the way from single cell trajectories, multicellular systems, you see they're all these linear ballistic trajectories while these organisms have complete freedom to go wherever they want to go. And that comes from the fact that in the ocean, when you think about ocean turbulence, the energy in the XY plane is actually much higher, so the organisms have absolutely no choice. Even if they moved around, they will really be swept up by the ocean. But on the Z axis, all the turbulence and the energy is extremely low. So you really are taking an elevator to be going up and down, and then depending on what the shear planes look like to be able to be distributed. So, you know, this is fun. I put this for Gaspar itself. Uh, one of this is Platinaris, and kind of one of the threads around is observing single-celled dial migration, because I'd shown you this sonar data sets on dial migration, but now these are very periodic structures. It's all completely connected to the circadian rhythms themselves. Um, and then let me just mention a word about diatoms. This is basically the most absolutely astounding movie that we have collected. Uh, this is, of course, uh, Gravity Machine was work with two graduate students, Deepak Krishnamurti and Hong Chuan Lee in the lab. And Deepak and I were in Puerto Rico in the lab. And of course, we put diatoms. Uh, you have to watch to appreciate this movie. Watch the time there and just see what happens. Uh, of course, as I had said, diatoms we didn't know had any organelles or anything. But watch what happens. It was sinking. And then literally in 100 millisecond, a single cell has the capacity to modulate the density roughly by 5%. And then right there, it's just absolutely stationary. It's not interacting with anything. And then, boom, it decides, oh, it's time to go. And then it's the periodic behavior. We were just in uh, the Arctic, and we found a certain set of species. This is We've tried every diatom species we've tried so far actually do these blinks. And we have no idea both how and why. Uh, and this is why this movie remains one of my favorite data sets that I've collected. Of course, we have been doing a lot of uh, ion channel blockers, and we do believe that this is a response from a very fast ion channels. And again, you know, uh, evolutionarily, you might think about this, you know, what was the purpose of evolution of ion channels? And they might have many other roles than just uh, for us to think. Uh, and again, you know, one of the things is, uh, this is a data set from a single cell. This is Akashivo. You can start suddenly seeing why cell polarity and cell structure matters a lot. Uh, right there, uh, you notice the little arm. And again, it is mapping, and it gets confused with the kinds of orientation. And very quickly, it's going to lock in into the gravity axis again. It's actually doing an active migration downwards. Uh, of course, these single cells do uh, dial migrations. But of course, the cell geometry matters. And then the smallest organism we can track is coccolithophores themselves, because they play a very important role in the biological uh, kind of the carbon flux that I was talking about. Uh, OK, so I think you know, these wheels have bec been becoming more and more complicated over time. Uh, you know, there are accidents that happen as well. This is a pressure experiment after 40 uh, atmosphere, uh, the wheel explodes. This is not fun. You don't want to be close to this wheel, so we do close all our chambers. Uh, uh, but you know, at this point, we are able to do several different perturbations. And then just as a clarification, what we are taking is we're taking a spatial pattern in the ocean, and we are turning into a temporal pattern. So from the organism's point of view, it's essentially seeing a gradient, although in many cases, there is actually no gradient in the wheel itself. The gradient is in time. OK, so let's go back to Hawaii. Uh, this was the observation that we had made. Uh, here are the sets of cells. And of course, over time, when we started making and going on boats, we realized that the boat actually tilts by 50 degrees, uh, 15 degrees. 50 would be we would topple over. Uh, uh, and act that led to an idea that we can perturb gravity. And now we can use these perturbations, so we have this now in the lab, to essentially see how quickly would a single cell respond uh, to a perturbation on gravity. So let me show you the kind of data that we found. Uh, this is just, uh, what does science look like out on a boat? This is literally how we were collecting the data. 
uh, you'll see a bench. Uh, and the reason I want to show this is this is just an advice uh, to uh, you know microscopists or uh, younger students. You know, when your experiment is working, collect all your data. Uh, because literally three hours after this, we were hit by a storm. The entire expedition had to be canceled, and I was quite sad. I mean, we did collect some of the data, but we had to turn around. And it's been two and a half years now, and we cannot find the cell in the wild. So we are still searching, but you know, at least, uh, uh, at least we found something. And what we found was that the cell stage and cell cycle was actually very important. We can find rising cells and sinking cells, and you can see that both of these cells look very different. This is undergoing division while this is a vegetative state. And that gave us an idea to start actually mapping the cell cycle. So this is what's happening, uh, is that the cell in its cell cycle in its vegetative state is up there. I love, Adam came up with this beautiful idea. We call these whale bars because we want to insert ecology in our micrographs. So this is essentially you know, multiple whales. This is around 150 meters. But what we were starting to observe in the, uh, in the Kilomoana data is that we would see this division, cell division would happen, that the cell would rise, come back, and then go back and forth. Now the question is, at what time scale was this happening? And we brought these cells to the lab, and this is when the puzzle became even more paradoxical. What we observe is that these cells, when they divide, massively inflate. So this is a 10-minute movie, and we are looking at a six to 10-fold volume expansion of a single cell. So you know, for the biochemist in the room, no biochemistry and enzyme should actually work if you were to dilute them tenfold. So you know, what the hell just happened there? And I'm so happy that there was a talk on stomata and many other things. What we have discovered is that this is intake of water. Uh, and actually what that does, because if you just intake seawater, you can be buoyant like seawater, but you can never rise. So this is taking fresh water in, and exactly when this expansion happens is when we actually see this density change. And this is when the organism is turning back up again. But now the question is, you know, uh, how would, uh, as a cell, you would control it? So we start looking at the cell cycle. It's not a circadian rhythm per day, but it's a seven-day cell cycle. And what's happening essentially in this data set is you will see these massive events. Of course, the plastids are going up and down per day. Uh, but I know there is a video so that right there. That was the expansion event right there. And so it's fast expansion. And then for the next seven days, it will remain in this vegetative state and then have another uh, cell division. Um, so now the question is, you know, how, how can this rapid cell expansion be even tolerated by the cell? And this is where topology comes into play, which is when we started doing light sheet images for these sets of cells, we stumbled upon this remarkable architecture that this cell actually shows, uh, which is the cell itself is this massive reticulated network. So the cytoplasm is not a ball. What we call these are end toruses. So if you take a donut, but you punch tons and tons of holes in it, you would find this reticulated structure. And what's happening is that the vacuole and this uh, cytoplasm are actually interlinked topologically. You can see the nucleus is at the bottom, and then the sets of cytoplasmic threads go through the vacuole. But when this expansion happens, because this is a one-dimensional structure, it essentially stretches but never inflates. And this is really the reason why a cell like this can actually uh, survive something like this. Now, this is a long, uh, we've been now working on cell division of this uh, crazy geometry. It's actually quite a complex structure. And just in TEM, we can confirm that these sets of reticulated tubes are, have membranes. This is where the plastids travel, uh, and that majority of that structure is essentially that uh, vacuum. This is that same data sets now in inflation, and you can start seeing. We can take these data sets and quantify exactly the amount of volume change. And one of the things that we find is that all of this volume change is essentially in the vacuole itself, uh, and the cytoplasm volume essentially remains completely the same. You know, just for fun, you can print these cells, and you can start thinking about these topologies to begin with. Uh, and again, you know, from a molecular perspective, we were very interested in looking at aquaporins. So once we do uh, some of the transcriptomics, we actually do find four or six uh, of these aquaporins. We've been playing with this uh, to try to find uh, blockers for some of these aquaporins. But one of the fun things, I was quite surprised that this assay worked. We were interested in what the signal for this would be. 
And the signal actually turns out to be much simpler. It's just contact with seawater itself. So pre-division, this has a spore layer called dinosporin. Most dinoflagellates have this. But if we mechanically perturb that, making this uh, cell come in contact with seawater, you'll immediately see that triggers this inflation event. And if we remove calcium, we can suppress this, you add calcium, and then this inflation event would begin right away. Uh, so now the question then becomes is, uh, what might be the types of factors when we're starting to think about uh, uh, motility and dynamics as a function of cell cycle? And I'm gonna run out of time, so maybe I'll just mention this as a framework you know, when you look at uh, what we want to do is to be able to describe the cell cycle, uh, you know, I can just describe cell cycle non-dimensionalized to the time scale of the cell division, uh, and essentially you get the cell cycle. Uh, but now what's very interesting is, is what we are interested in is trying to define from these sets of parameters of what's happening in the vacuole, what's happening in the cytoplasm, uh, how would uh, the behavior of this organism change as a function of time? And again, what's remarkable about this cell is it needs to go to depths because it's not a mixotroph. It needs certain kinds of nutrients that are only accessible at the bottom. Light is at the top, so it is making this kind of uh, a journey. And I think, you know, I'm going to skip much of the... Uh, the kind of details of the model. The first thing we were able to do is actually measure cell density as a function of uh, uh, cell cycle, and then essentially put this three sets of parameters in this model. One is sedimentation, which is the rate at which something sinks as a function of cell density. But now the cell density is effective cell density. It has both vacuole uh, and uh, cytoplasm included in it. Then we want to put ecology which is that the fact that this is a pycnocline and the seawater density itself is changing as a function of depth. So this is where ecology comes into play. Physiology is that because both radius and density is changing, and radius is a critical parameter, remember here, uh, to the rate of square in sedimentation. And then finally, you can put some of these pieces together as a function of cell cycle, uh, non-dimensionalized, do some algebra. And this is what falls out. You know, I absolutely love this because in a single equation, we now have, this is behavior, this is ecology, and this is physiology. And, you know, you would look at this equation, look at critical parameters, and something really fun falls out of this. First of all, this actually looks like a parabola. You can see that r squared term. So this has a mathematical analogy to a slingshot. And the slingshot here is it's not an inertial slingshot. The slingshot is that inflation event. That inflation event is enough for you to actually traverse up-down. And then when you look at this critical condition, we can draw the phase diagram. So now, hypothetically, if the cell density of different types of cells was changing, and as a function, I had some amount of radius change, you notice this zone is, we call it a gravity trap. It's a gravity trap that no matter what you do, your trajectories will eventually sink. Because if you fall a certain distance, you or your progeny has to rise that same distance or else you're done because eventually you will sick over millions of years. Uh, and one of the things that ends up happening is there's a very sharp boundary. And if I was to draw an asymptote right here, it falls around the cytoplasmic density, which happens to match the average cytoplasmic density of cells on our planet. So it's kind of an interesting analogy because life did evolve in the ocean. And again, we are now trying to build a much larger database. But with no fitting parameters, that number just falls out uh, primarily that there would be a gravitational trap that the cell would not want to cross. So this is, you know, combination of geometry, uh, physiology, ecology, uh, leading to kind of an insight that we didn't even know when we were starting this as a project. So I'm going to switch to a little more shape and form. And I apologize now in the talk with looking at the time. I'm going to go exponentially faster because I just want to now give you teasers. And so you will see that uh, we, you know, I hopefully we'll finish or we'll stop. Uh, okay, so let's jump to behavior. Uh, and then again, if you save your questions, I'll answer a whole bunch of questions. Uh, one of the big things in behavior that we've been thinking about is, you know, there's just an incredible diversity of just unicellular protists. And people have, of course, been thinking about behavior for a very long time. Of course, there was a historic a uh, misstep that we took in biology where we started thinking about, oh, there might be a proto-nervous system in protists themselves. What they were discovering at that time uh, was really just the cytoskeleton. 
so there is no proto-nervous system, but you know, how the hell does all of this behavior arise and how is it coupled to cellular geometry? And I'm gonna choose one of my favorite cells that we used to study this is Lacrimaria Oler. And then going back to the context of Foldscope, you know, of course, uh, I discovered this cell uh, with my postdoc, Scott Coyle, who now has his own lab, uh, poking around in a swamp uh, back uh, behind Facebook's offices without asking Facebook. Uh, uh, and this remarkable cell popped out, and this is really what I was talking about in terms of, you know, what the hell moment. Uh, so this is a data set that's generated. Uh, everything is in real time. The only thing that I've added to it is I wish the music, uh, uh, the music is artificial, but everything else is real data. This is full scope data out in the field, but the, it's a single cell. You know, it's not a worm, it's, it's not, it's a single cell, and you can see that's the cell body that's roughly around 60 micron, and uh, it does what it does, but it looks cute, but it's actually a predator and you're going to see what it does to this poor cell right here, right there. That's a strike. And it's going to conform and change its geometry and engulf this and then go about doing that same business over and over again. You know, what's remarkable is you're looking at a same cell morphologically change in real time. The big question is what would encode this? And then Scott recently collected this data set, which is now that same cell also in another wild condition. Here you can't even see the cell. The cell is right here, that's 60 micron, and it sends these extensions that can be as large as a millimeter. I mean, how the hell would you generate all that membrane and all the cytoskeletal structure? Of course, it's a ciliate, it has a cortical cytosol structure that I'll talk about. And then of course, as a fishing pole, look at the size of this animal it's going to eat. Uh, it's, uh, so, you know, this is appetizing for what is to come for dinner. Uh, so, you know, again, going back to a paradox, we map the strain and the strain rate in a system, and it's basically far out. How would a cell change its morphology so rapidly? What types of cytoskeletal structures would you need? Also, where is this behavior encoded? You know, how does it know where to turn and what to do. This is just higher resolution movies now collected in the lab. You can see that the cell is motile, but when it does its search, it has an anchor pad. It will anchor it at a given location and spend some time, maybe say 10, 15 minutes searching, move to the next location. It's very much like graduate students. I don't know if you guys do this in Germany. We do this all the time. Search extensively in one building, and then if you don't find food, move to the next building. This is called local global search. But look at this dynamics. What we want to be able to explain is who's controlling this dynamics. And I'm going to tell you a really very simple, but I believe it's, it's quite profound answer to something like this. And then again, just to show you the cytoskeleton and the details of what happens right there, you can see it's coated with cilia, and we'll talk about ciliary activity. And right there, it's actually modifying its uh, cortical structure right there. And uh, these sets of striations are essentially microtubules. So, how do we even begin thinking about a structure like this? There is activity that's coming from the cilia. There are two types of cilia. There is the tip cilia and the body cilia. Uh, we essentially label a lot of cytoskeleton elements. There is centrins, there are microtubule structures. Now they're all anchored in the membrane because there is finite amount of membrane. In this much amount of time, you can't make membrane. So there is a folding membrane structure. And all of these sets of constraints should give rise to a certain dynamics. And of course, uh, on the previous published work, uh, we have shown sort of where does this behavior, uh, what does it look like? And what came as a surprise is, you know, I can map the tip of the cell while it's searching and then normalize it to draw these clouds. These clouds don't have any blind spots. Even behind its back, it is searching extensively. And within around a few minutes of these sites of birth, it's able to search, hop to the new place. So this hopping happens over hours. This happens over millisecond, and it's able to search cloud around in minutes. So how would you remember that you've searched to the right, or search? where is that information encoded to begin with? And uh, since this is published, I'm not gonna spend too much time. You know, you can think about this, that some of it is actually coming from the buckling modes, because the cell is essentially buckling, and then that can be seen when you map some of the shape modes associated with something like this. Uh, and that led us to start really thinking about uh, the geometry 
of behavior in a system like this. You know, search is a very classical phenomena, but how would a cell like this search? So I'm gonna show you a very simple mathematical model uh, which uh, Deepak Krishnamurti in the lab built, uh, where we are going to add activity at a tip of elastic filaments. And we just first want to see what do elastic filaments, I mean, this is, we call this approach model by construction. There are lots of complexities in biology, but we want to start with the simplest possible model, which is a simple elastic structure uh, with activity, but that turns on and off. Because what you observe in the video, I think here, just to illustrate that, this is a high-speed video. These are what we call head cilia. They're the ones that generate these sets of stretching forces. And then very quickly, when you'll see the retraction event will happen, these cilia fold. Uh, and that's what leads to this sets of a retraction, and it's about to happen at this point. Uh, and so this activity at the tip is being modulated on and off. Uh, and of course, uh, the question to then think about is, oh, right there was that reversal, and you see that has folded. And then these sets of uh, the next cilia are essentially reversing. So uh, since I'm going to run out of time, maybe I'm just going to show you the model directly. Uh, you know, once you put in all the sets of parameters, do the hydrodynamics, this is what falls out. You can actually get these sets of buckling parameters, but it's far more interesting to begin with, which is now here is a puzzle for you. So we are putting everything to be deterministic in this model. The elasticity is defined, the activity is defined, the activity time scale is defined, and you notice that these filaments are doing funky things. Uh, let me just drag it a little bit, uh, and you start realizing, oh, wait a second, this is an oscillator. Uh, with a very specific uh, geometry to it. This is a six-period oscillator, and you can count after this where it's going to go. It's going to be exactly predictable. It goes in that exact same cycle. You know, this is a 10-period oscillator. But now all I'm going to do is in this parameter space just change the elasticity or this activity period a tiny bit, and suddenly a chaos ensues. I'm, I literally mean truly chaos which is they become uh, these aperiodic systems. Uh, and uh, let me just drag it up here. Now, this oscillator has no periodicity, and it is literally searching entire space. And one way, mathematically, to think about it, it's forgetting as quickly as possible where it was before. Because if there is any correlation into what you're searching, then you are essentially not forgetting. And so in this scenario, there is no predictability. This is a true chaotic oscillator, only arising from elasticity and activity. And one of the things we can do is we can actually mathematically write this down and show in terms of phase space, where is this uh, a periodic behavior? Where is this uh, periodic behavior? And that couples very well with the search clouds that they generate. And to kind of cut this long story short, uh, where does this come from? Why, why is this phenomena so profound? And this is a very fundamental idea that was actually developed when we were thinking about rockets. So rockets were quite unstable because people would shoot rockets, and I'm sure in fireworks you've all seen this. It doesn't go straight. Why does it not go straight? It's because the force that's being applied is actually the function of the geometry. So the orientation, it's very different from compression. This is not our classic Euler buckling because the force is anchored to the geometry and it's always uh, in parallel to the shape. So you can see that the orientation of the force itself essentially changes over time. And this is exactly the same thing that happens in a rocket when the rocket is going. Any vibrational modes essentially lead to these trajectories. And mathematically, this was called follower force. And you can do a literally what is called a garden hose instability experiment. So tonight, if some of you go home and like to water your plants, instead of holding the hose at the tip, hold it at a little bit at the back. Don't blame me if you get wet. Turn the crank of the water fully. And what you would see is you've actually generated a chaotic oscillator. But in biological context, not only is this a chaotic oscillator, the biology is actually tuning this. And we can show that by tuning essentially sets of parameters, so first of all, we can mathematically demonstrate that this is truly a chaotic oscillator. We can write down the bifurcation diagrams for this. But really exciting is tuning these sets of parameters. And I kind of start thinking about this in the context of rate encoding in neurons. By tuning the sets of activities on and off, you can home, you can go to a certain location, you can come back, you can shut down. And anyway, there's a lot of sort of 
programming of this activity that's arriving from the physical system. So now, going back a little bit to the cytoskeletal side, because I know many of you think about the cytoskeletal structures, I just want to play this movie one more time. We were really puzzled by, I mean, that looks like a millimeter long cytoskeletal structure, so what does that look like? Where does this go? How does that cytoskeleton? Clearly, something has to be folding and unfolding. Uh, and Ellie in the lab, uh, who's been working on this uh, for a while, essentially labeled uh, many sets of uh, you know, centrins, but I'm just going to focus on microtubule for a second. So whenever people see this image, they think it's a basket. This is a Z projection. It is essentially a helical coil with a changing uh, pitch. Uh, and it's all anchored to the membrane, and we have these two states in which we fix. This was the state in which it's uh, retracted, this is extended, and what you're seeing is that this is the follow-up of that uh, microtubule structure going across. Now, you know, there is very special space here, which we call the transition zone, and what's happening for this tech to be able to extend, you have to deploy this microtubule in real time and be able to fold it back again, and we, kind of the analogy that we give is we call it a fishing line, essentially, and of course, we've done a lot of TEM on this to really try to determine how does the membrane and the microtubules play. So the first thing that boils down is when you do the back of the number calculation, how much microtubule can you even store in this type of a shape and a structure? And uh, the answer was that we needed something to be able to store far more microtubules. Otherwise, when it extends, uh, it should have uh, no microtubule because just the total length didn't make sense from a context of surface area. And what we discovered is uh, you know, just really remarkable geometry. So first of all, it's not single microtubules. They're actually sheets, and I'll show you why these sheets are important. These are sheets of 15 microtubules that form. They're, of course, the membrane is essentially folded. This is where the membrane comes from. You can see when the cell is extended, the membrane is smooth. When it's contracted, it has these folds. And in every one of these folds, there's actually multiple layers of microtubules folded. So what's happening when you look at these cross sections of fluorescence, you can see microtubule bundles here and here. And it's very much like you know, if you are a cat and you're uh, making a spool, you know you can spool on top of it. So the microtubules are literally layered and spooled on top of it together. And of course, every one of these are bundles of these 13 microtubules. Um, and then you can actually also see in some of them, you can notice the ciliary pits are right there. So there is a lot of uh, kind of mathematical formulation that we are structuring, but just one hint that I'll give you here uh, is why make bundles? And it actually turns out when you write down the moment arm of a structure like this and write down the bending energy and the twist energy for a system, there's actually an energy barrier. Microtubules are quite stiff. So when you're deployed in this state and when you're deployed in this state, there is a preferential state that they want to bend in and the curvature they want to have, but you're constrained with the membrane because you're really tightly anchored in the membrane. And that by itself essentially gives this shape. So if you were to tug on this, uh, I don't know why it advanced. If you were to tug on this microtubule structure, there is an energy barrier and there will be a transition from this state to this state, and that's why we call it spooling. And similarly, when you essentially do contraction, the same sets of things get folded back again. And you know, it's, it's remarkable because they do this over you know, hundreds and hundreds of cycles uh, over, you know, uh, for their entire lifetime. Um, okay, so I think uh, I am looking at, maybe we only have five minutes left, right? Um, so unfortunately, the, the rest of the 300 slides will have to wait for another day. Um, I guess, you know, I think maybe one thread that I'll just mention is uh, uh, kind of the context of cilia and geometry. Uh, I think this is an analogy we've been thinking about. It's a very important time in science to really be able to understand this object very well. Beautiful microstructure and ultrastructure has been uh, uh, put together. And I think the way I think about from a physics context, cilia truly is the hydrogen atom of motility. When you start thinking about, you can understand single cilia, you can understand the dynamics, there's a lot of nonlinear dynamics associated, then you can understand how they all couple together and that leads to behavior. And then this entire framework to be thought about allows us to explore, uh, you know, of course, uh, a context of starting to add complexity. And what's quite beautiful again in this problem is geometry. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that I mentioned is we study ciliary bands in Pteria miniata and 
all of the behaviors that are encoded actually arise from the geometries of these bands. And just what I find really remarkable is using these sets of frameworks to really understand how do these sets of uh, bizarre, I mean, this is one of my favorite ciliary band right there. It's like the crown of the queen. But you know, what the hell is that doing? What does that geometry actually do? So we've been mapping these behaviors in the gravity machine, volumetric imaging of these sets of bands, and I just wanna show you a mathematical framework for this, is that we've been also building these mathematical models that allow us to think about what's happening uh, in these structures. So this is a tennis ball analogy to this. Sometimes being able to mathematically simplify geometry and topology and shape and form is very important. So everybody knows what a tennis ball curve is. Tennis ball curve essentially divides surface area of a sphere in two. And then just using this as a parameter to just see if I was to put cilia along these parameterized curves, which I've done here, what would be the kinds of shapes that arises? And just in a very simple parametric space, we can try to understand these uh, you know, model ciliary bands all the way from as geometry is going, you know, equator you can understand, and then you can understand as these sets of things get complex, the trajectories that they will take in 3D space start to actually change. So anyway, uh, there is kind of a context of thinking about geometry in this framework. Uh, and let me end by showing, that's, I, I wish we had time. We'll, we'll have to wait uh, someday. Uh, okay, no, let me, let me jump to something that is very important to actually think about and spend just two minutes on. Uh, I think, you know, of course, I, I talked about lots of ideas and discoveries that we get to make, but I think it's something that all of us have to appreciate and understand that we have a remarkable luxury to be curious. You know, we talk about curiosity-driven science, uh, and if we could share that sense of curiosity with a broader group of people, what would happen? And then again, you know, in this perspective of thinking about an incredible number of challenges that we face, we start realizing that sometimes, rather than thinking about solutions, if you can provide the tools and the means to those sets of tools and access, that completely changes how you would think about these sets of problems. So we've been thinking about this for a while, and the framework that we use is essentially what we call frugal science. There's all kinds of fun tools that we make. Um, this is a, a fun analogy of uh, thinking about human-powered centrifugation. Uh, I don't know if some of you have played with yo-yos. We started looking at toys, and based on those toys, we essentially discovered uh, that this one is a fun one. Let me just play this one. I don't know how many of you have played with this toy as a kid. Uh, raise of hands. It's, uh, so usually this one tells me the age of the group because now the more younger generations are into fidget spinners and other things. Uh, you know, historically what was really fun about that just toy is I was, I was back in Uganda coming back on a trip and I realized that uh, uh, centrifugation was a huge problem because there's no electricity at the clinic, and if there is no electricity at the clinic, you know, how the hell do you really do sample preps? And on the flight coming back, I was thinking about toys. We stumbled upon that, and then we realized that that little toy that you all call button on a string is actually the oldest toy in the history of mankind. Uh, it's been found in all cultures, you know, 5,000, 6,000 years ago. You know, you can mathematically write it down. The irony was for 5,000 years, nobody asked how it works. That's the beauty of toy and recreation. You don't have to think, you just play and do. But because once we understand it, we can actually turn that into a diagnostic test. And at this point, we hold the world record for the fastest spinning object with human power. And we can spin this object for roughly around 125,000 RPM. So this is an equivalent of 30,000 G forces. So although these are simple tools, this is actually gonna compete some of these large centrifuges that you might be using. But the joy of why I'm sharing this is what's important is when you share these sets of tools with communities. So we openly shared this. This is one of our field sites in Madagascar with a village chief essentially using the tool. And then again, now there are hundreds of designs out there. Uh, there are bacterial infection, uh, lots of diagnostic tests associated with this. We've been doing this for a lot of different tools. Uh, you know, especially uh, for mosquitoes and detecting mosquitoes with cell phones. Uh, we've been doing this for molecular assays to be able to have communities run molecular assays in the field. Uh, this is for microscopy, especially from the context of the ocean. This is a planktoscope. Uh, 
lots of instruments that are associated with science. And then I think I'm going to end with this picture uh, that I am excited about. And how many of you have actually used a fold scope before? OK, so very few. So I think I'm going to end here. But I have a fold scope. And if people want to see what this is, it's an origami microscope that you play with. But let me just, you know, I think when I think about sharing science, one of the things that becomes an important is to empower others to be able to engage. So you know, when we think about science and scientists, we are quite biased because every one of these kids is a scientist. You know, a village in a tribal context is a scientist. And at this point, there is a very large community, a global community. This has become the world's largest microscopy community at this time. And you know, they are in conflict zones. This is Iraq. Uh, here are fun parents who don't want to share microscope with their own child. Uh, but let me just end with this picture. You know, this is a picture from a rural village in uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, this was sent to me by a teacher. This one single teacher in the last five years has trained around 120,000 kids across India. And this is when, when I'm depressed and I'm thinking about all these sets of problems and challenges in the world, I look back and think about the you know, the power of uh, just humanity sometimes. And again, uh, you know, two million is still a very small drop in the ocean. Uh, but, you know, when I think about these sets of kids and I'm thinking about the kind of excitement, uh, it is extremely important in science that we have to build all folds of people into the domain of science. You know, if we don't do that, I am quite worried that, uh, you know, even science as a discipline and the kind of support uh, and the kind of uh, joy that we all get uh, would actually get stripped away. So this is sort of a more of a call to action for anybody who is interested in engaging. Uh, I have a very special sample here to entice you. I was in Delft. For the last 10 years, I've been wanting to visit Leeuwenhoek's home. So this is literally from the pond, five meters from his home, which he has described in his letter. And I'm just documenting every single thing that I can find in this. So if you want to play with some of that water, I'll do a demo outside, or we can set something here. And then again, thank you so much. I apologize for uh, taking more time. Many thanks, Manu, for this exciting talk. Uh, questions? Over there. And while they're moving mics, if anybody's figured out the donut, please do shout out the answer. Yeah, this was an amazing talk. Thanks a lot. So I was wondering how climate change will affect the migration phenomena you talked mm -hmm. about. Yeah, I think we are currently running assays. But I mean, in the coral community, it's very clear that the pH of the ocean is already playing a very important role in the developmental context of thinking about in what ranges and temperatures. I think we are just starting to run these assays in a systematic way. Of course, there is a lot of variability already in the ocean in the context of certain sets of parameters, depending on the latitude of the same organism. So we don't even know what the behavioral plasticity of organisms that is already present is. And it's actually important to do this in a context of wild collected organisms. The migration pattern that I showed you, there is a dinoflagellate that we do have that has been in culture for the last you know, five, 10 years. The organisms that we got from the field, within four or five generation times, they stopped doing the migration. They are bathed in massive amount of nutrient. Why do they even need to go up and down? So I think these are very important experiments, and that's how we've been building these. But we have to do them in an ecological context. So there are two ships that we are installing that machine in to really try to do systematic assays for the future ocean. I think uh, the biggest thing that I'm worried about is its coupling to the carbon sequestration because we are pumping so much carbon to begin with, the sets of processes that essentially sink that carbon, it's not actively known. And one of the things that's very important is the bacterial component. Because with marine snow, we can study as this little particle of dead goo and poop, literally, is falling four or five kilometers, the kinds of bacteria that are hopping in and out. And if it stays in that early zone a little longer, then there is too much metabolic activity, and that carbon that was being fixed is being pumped out and recirculated again. So you know, this is going to become a massive effort. At this point, we have an engine of 10 of these machines. 
And uh, very soon, we will be bringing these machines online. So anybody with an internet connection can just log in. They will be filled with plankton all the time. And you can track your favorite plankton. Uh, and essentially, all of the data sets will be open. But I think it's a big endeavor to take. Uh, and especially, currently, behavior is not even a part of how we even think about that context. Other questions? Minten, I have one. Um, so um, you saw one of the tools that you have for, for the spinning this, for, mm -hmm. for um, a diagnostics. What do you think is the... I like that he said spinning disk. Yeah, well, for me, it looks like a spinning disk. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. no, I like it, yeah. But then, uh, I, I would call it as a jojo, no? It's what yeah, you were talking yeah. about the, when, yeah. when we, yeah. yes. the, the age we have, no? But then, um, what do you think is the next challenge? In, because, of course, you have, for example, a false code. You can see malaria, no? Mm -hmm. in, 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 in the erythrocytes. You can uh, separate blood. What do you think are the... Mm -hmm. next challenges that may be uh, overcome by this type of approaches? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the big ones when COVID hit uh, for us was to be able to do an electricity-free molecular amplification-based assay for a price point of less than a dollar. And so if uh, we've now, uh, I mean, we've been working on that for two or three years because, you know, of course, I mean, we work in Guatemala and Ecuador, and we looked at the prices for one PCR COVID test, it's $300. And then the annual income, and you think about in a country like that, it's just, I mean, that's outrageous to even think about, $1,000 for a whole year. Uh, so of course, molecular diagnostics and really getting molecular capabilities out uh, in the hands of everyday people. We ran a, a validation trial for 1,000 people who had never done any science experience in their kitchen to actually run amplification assays using this device. Uh, it just literally looks like a syringe. So I think that, that's one big challenge to think about. One of the other frameworks that's associated is, of course, machine learning is very exciting in this space right now. We are in an era or a moment where a lot of machine learning can be implemented on the imaging tools, but there are no data sets. So if you think about malaria, for example, we've been working on that for a decade, there are roughly around 300 million slides that are imaged every year. But if I was to ask you, where is the digital data so you can actually really train, there's basically nothing. And so a huge set of a challenge essentially exists in collecting the kind of data that's needed to be able to build uh, these augmented models, because otherwise, many of those models will fail miserably when they go out. And this is the irony is that although technology advances so rapidly, in places like these where markets fail, you know, there are no incentives to really go out and essentially build the infrastructure. So one of the other things that is top of our plate is to build a research capacity network as well of microscopes, uh, which are, uh, I think, you know, of course, many of you have seen Foldscope, but there is another, two other instruments that we have released. One is called Squid and the other is Octopi. And these are automated instruments. And so I think the other challenge that I'm excited about is not only enabling uh, the, the sense of uh, diagnostics, but also enabling the capacity to do research in many places around the world. So this is an example of 30 different scientific instruments that you can put together in a completely open source framework that try to compete with just everything that there is this culture of you know, just getting a packaged bought instrument and that really blocks a ton of people to be able to do science to begin with. So there is also a bridge between what you deploy and develop in a healthcare context, but also making sure that the tools are also accessible to research communities more broadly itself. All of this is documented and online. If any of you is interested in, uh, you know, building microscopes, look at these sets of resources. There's a there is around 37 different types of microscopes we have built with this modular framework. Uh, and you know, gravity machine is just one of them. A yeah. uh, very naive question. So uh, regarding the this, uh, species that makes mm -hmm. this long tube, so have you ever observed one divide? And, yes. and whether it help, help how to understand how you template this, this organization? And yeah. second question is, is there septins? And are they important for this? Uh, yeah, I think the septins, uh, I don't. Uh, and export protein also. Yeah, uh, I think on the division side, uh, we've looked at the division plane itself. These are very difficult cells to uh, keep in culture. 
Uh, so we, we happen to have a natural source and we bring them back in. And I think uh, some of the, we don't know whether in our lab cultures they're dividing as quickly as possible. Uh, this is a very classical thing on a division side. There is a lot of ciliates that have this helical cortical structure. Uh, and you know, essentially, you're absolutely right. The development of that is actually encoded in the template of the mother itself. So when this sort of uh, structure is essentially dividing, you essentially see two helices arrive, and then it pinches off. Uh, I think why we chose this specific system was really for its dynamics. And during division, all dynamics stops. Uh, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, they're not feeding at that time. One thing that's really fun we can do is we can chop their neck off, and we can watch the growth and development uh, of uh, essentially a new head. And the nucleus never juts out. The nucleus is actually anchored in the body. You can imagine if the nucleus had shot out, because when you extend, flow happens, because there's a lot of cytoplasm that has to fill in. But the nucleus and many of the important organelles are never in the neck, because these cells get attacked by other things as well, or just mechanically get severed in some ways. Uh, and then on the membrane side, I think that's really one of the big things that we are doing right now to include on the constraint. One of the things that we've discovered is uh, there is actually a, a topological. The way the membrane is folded, and I don't have too much time to talk about this, but there's actually a very specific architecture. It's a sheet. You know, Often enough in origami, you think about flat creases. This is, uh, I think, in my mind, the first example of a curved origami in a living system. Because the, your plane of fold in the origami is actually a curve. And what that leads to is that when that membrane folds and unfolds, there is actually a transition from what is flat and flat locally, because it's never flat. It's a cylinder, so it always has this curvature. And this is why this membrane essentially constrains that when you pull on this neck, the membrane that's popping and unfolding is only in the transition zone. And this is actually very relevant to some of the proteins around that time, because when you want to backfold it, you don't want it to scrunch up. You want it to fold exactly in that same crease. So we have a really beautiful mechanical model at this time of this, of a, literally a piece of paper that we can scrunch back and forth. And all of that actually goes back to shape and form, uh, because this particular geometry has a transition point from flat to folded. And it only occurs for curved origami. It's actually not true for flat origami. So I think there's a lot more geometry on the membrane that I didn't get a chance to talk about. But uh, you know, I think one thing that we don't see particular structures other than these microtubule plates that follow the fold. So we do believe that these microtubule plates make the membrane stiff along some axis. And the gap between these two is really where it would fold. Because it can, I mean, it's so stiff, it cannot fold along that plane. So it has to fold on the other side of the plane. Thanks so much, Manu. That was beautiful. Um, I have a question regarding the, the buoyancy regulation of these single cells, right? I mean, I can see how changing volume and size changes cell density, but how does a diatome do it? Like, how yes. does a diatome stop? Any, any ideas? There like? is no expansion in a diatom, I no, can exactly, tell you, yeah. because it's stuck. Uh, with diatoms, essentially, what we are exploring is uh, ion channels. So when we do certain sets of calculations, with that type of a fast transition and just an average number of ion channels, it is actually true that if you would get certain selective ion channels. I think one of the... We're trying to move that system to a molecularly tractable system. So we've been looking at Pseudonychia and a couple other diatoms to try to get. One thing that's very exciting is very recently, somebody finally figured out how to patch clamp a diatom. And lo and behold, you see actually spikes. And so it's kind of an interesting thread that as yet we don't know because we haven't gotten calcium imaging working. I do believe that we will find a calcium pulse associated with that blip. Uh, but right now, the current hypothesis is that it's ion flux. So, you know, uh, it's, uh, I don't know how many of you are Star Wars and these fans of, uh, you know, I, we call it uh, ionic uh, propulsion. But effectively, by being able to pump these things back and forth, you can modulate density. Uh, there's a couple other ideas that we have, uh, but, you know, I think the strongest evidence is that some of the ion channel blockers, we can put them and then all of this activity goes away. But they are too brute force, so I'm, I'm not so happy with it as yet.
But I mean, it really remains a mystery because, I mean, one thing that I just want to mention is I just showed a few sets of things that we dove a little bit deeper, but when we release this motility database, you will see this is ubiquitous phenomena and it's a convergence because all cells need to do this. And so there might be very divergent mechanisms that are trying to do the same thing. And so this is also why it's not just one, because every cell has to care about where it is in the ocean in an aquatic context. Some of them are going to use motility mechanisms. Some of them, uh, I mean, there is a class of cyanobacteria that does have gas bubbles. That's a little more of a straightforward type of a mechanism. But there is a many more mechanisms to be found trying to do the same thing.